from the former convent of the Good Shepherd overlooking Inwood Hill Park in New York City. Welcome to Inwood Artworks On Air. It's where you meet the musicians, filmmakers, writers, theater makers, and artists of all stripes who make their home what we affectionately call Upstate Manhattan. I'm your host, Aaron Sims, and today we welcome composer and musician Charlie Kirchen. Charlie is a music maker and theorist based here in Inwood. He composes, improvises, plays bass, and leads bands. Roughly situated in the realm of the jazz experimental music genre, his music reflects an aesthetic and technique gained from study of the broad sweep of both jazz and Western classical music, as well as immersion in American pop music of the past 50 years. His compositions are made of a handful of notated themes, which are related by subtle motivic and structural correspondences and linked together by passages of free improvisation. As a theorist, He's working on a dissertation at Columbia University, which studies cases to theorize the nature of musical influence, drawing on ideas surrounding notions of creativity, embodied cognition, hybridity, craft, and aesthetics in the process. If you wonder what all that means and have no fear about that, we'll get to that soon. But first, let's go where words fail and listen now to a composition by Charlie Kirchen. Thank you. 
stuff charlie thank you for coming here to in what artworks on air it's great to have you yeah thanks for having me glad to be here you betcha um so how are you pretty good well i'm glad we finally got you here uh so can you tell us what did we just hear um so that was the third section of a uh, suite of music i recorded summer 2021 um and yeah that's with my quartet all chicago musicians i live in chicago until 2018 um, so I still keep that band active. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, that's sort of, you described it in the biography you read straight up. That's sort of blending these uh, intricately notated themes and free improvisation, um, all of which is sort of controlled by various abstract and geometrical processes over the course of the larger piece. Very cool. Well, I thought it was important to begin our session with a reference of your work as for one, I feel like there is no description that can you be used officially, you know, and to effectively communicate and aptly describe, you know, music and words. It's, right. It's it's difficult. Uh, two, I'm also no musical theorist, uh, but uh, I love music, and I, I feel I don't possess the vocabulary to attempt to do so. And I feel like a lot of people are intimidated um, when they hear uh, perhaps something, you know, something that perhaps is inaccessible to them. Uh, to spe it speculates a lot of people might find this type of music difficult uh, for them to listen to and, or, mm -hmm. or be drawn to. Um, so and perhaps they're even intimidated by it in some ways. Um, so could you offer a couple clues as to what to listen for in your music and what we just heard uh, that might help people to enjoy it more and might also prove helpful in enjoying works by others in the genre? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's a really good question. I think with that music, something I really aspire to and something about the music that I admire that I really, um, that I'm drawn to by it is just melody. And I think in that last track, while it may be dense and the harmonies may be dense and some of the, the sounds may be uh, intense, I think there is melody happening all the time and there's like layers and layers of melody so i think to someone unfamiliar with this music if you just listen for the melody and you listen for tune i think that really opens up the music um and i think with this genre of music which is partially coming out of the work of someone like ornette coleman who's a 
pioneer of what we call free jazz. But again, these genre designations become useless pretty quickly. But his he had a whole his philosophy of music was based on this concept of harmelodics, which is basically. I mean, no, the, the thing about harmonics is no one really knows what it means, but the way I take it to mean is just, it's sort of an understanding of musical cohesion in which no matter what anyone is doing, it's a sort of way of hearing it fitting into an aggregate, which means that sort of musical coherence isn't governed by, you know, Western harmony, functional harmony, common practice harmony, but it's a way of hearing that just sort of takes in textures all at once and takes in all of their elements. And it's an aesthetic that uh, is, yes, I guess basically rooted in that idea of just like hearing sound together and taking sound as sound, um, as opposed to sound as something that's controlled by common practice harmony, for instance. Just taking it as it is, as it, as yeah. it exists. And then like improvising from the perspective of like, no matter what I am adding to this texture, it will be adding something to the texture and we'll all respond to it and we'll all respond to it in good faith without judgment, um, that sort of thing. And it builds, but you but use it to build around the melody, like the melodies, that, is, we say the melody is the anchor. I wouldn't say the not. melody is necessarily the anchor. I would say that everyone in that group's playing is very much rooted in a melodic sensibility, which mm -hmm sort of influences the material they offer to the composite. But I think ideally um, when people are improvising together at the highest levels, a sort of like, not to sound like a hippie or something, but in, in energy sort of emerges from the composite that feels like it's propelling the thing along. Um, and I think that's when I am making music, that's really the goal is to put things in that situation where the sort of information just seems to be sort of unfolding naturally as if by a will of its own. I think that's a really good, uh, I'll, I'll slightly translate more and tell me if I'm right. Like as if you were speaking towards a child, like it's about giving yourself over to the sound of the music. Totally, totally. And that's a very complicated balancing act because obviously the music itself, I mean, music itself is like a tough phrase, but you know, like if we stopped playing, the music would stop even though as we're playing, it feels like it could go on forever or something like that. Um, like for instance, a thought experiment I've often run through my head. A couple weeks ago, I was at a show and it was just grooving so intensely. And I was thinking like, what would happen if I got up out of my seat and just like pushed over the drums and like the music just like came to a stop like that. And I figured I would probably get beat up. And I think it would be a good thing that I got beat up. And I think that says something about just like, you know, people like protecting the music and stuff like that. But I also wonder to what extent would the music itself actually be hurting me? And would the intensity of the groove be actually hurting me? Um, which, I mean, it's a thought experiment, but I think that it, it sort of gets at something very important about the power of music and sort of this, this sensation of music generating itself and sort of having a mind of its own. Absolutely. Yeah. And finding and finding your place in the music. Right. Wherever mm -hmm. you are at that time. Right, right, right. It's also in relationship what's going on to you in your life at that moment. Definitely, definitely. Um, and yeah, I think also a big component of learning how to improvise um, in the style of the track we just listened to is... In a sense, and this is also what I would say to somebody who's unfamiliar with the idiom, is in a sense, like, you don't need to know anything about music to participate. And that's sort of, you know, the harmonic idea of any idea is valid and we're just going to, like, deal with the composite texture we're making and, like, that's cool. It sort of makes sense with that sort of way of thinking of, like, yeah. no, someone who's never touched an instrument before can, like, pick up a tambourine and play it and contribute to the texture. And sensitive musicians will respond to that and incorporate yeah. it into what they're doing. Um, so I think part of it, at least for me learning how to play music it's about really buying into that idea that like whatever you throw out there you need to have faith in it and you need to stand behind it and you need to sort of trust the others that they'll take it in the right spirit um, which is actually and also by the same token when you're playing when you're listening when you're responding to others you're sort of accepting what they're laying down with the same openness um, so I think like a lot, a big part of learning how to listen to this music and a big part of learning how to play this music is like that sort of, like it's almost a spiritual discipline, I guess. You mentioned openness, which is a wonderful, um, thing that I don't think that, um, a lot of people realize is a, a, a very, well, I feel someone who comes from a live performance background, uh, is an, is a essential part in the 
playing and the participation of the audience and music when it's done live. Because mm-hmm. uh, it's not just an openness for the listeners to experience it. The musicians also are being open to how mm-hmm. the music is being reacted to by those else in the room, correct? Mm-hmm. Yes. So it's, it's a symbiotic relationship in many ways of that openness of everyone giving themselves over to responding to they're responding to each other is what I'm trying to say. Yes, right? totally. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and I mean, think any, any live performer yeah. will, right. you know, talk about sort of the role that the audience has and cultivating whatever that energy in the air is from live performance. Yeah. Um, so not so hippie. Yeah. Pretty, pretty, pretty normal to I'm trying yeah, to say. Yeah, pretty normal, I'm just, yeah. My point is like I'm trying to normalize it saying <laughs> at the end of the days, if you cut through all that we just said and you want the Cliff Notes version, yeah. it's for everyone, no ex- prior experience required. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um <laughs> I mean, it's interesting too, this music, a lot of it comes out of these collectives like the AACM, Association of the Anti Creative Musicians, which was a group founded in like 1965 or something in Chicago. Um, it's, you know, very much a black thing and it's about the black community and about um, black art and black aesthetics. But anyways, the AACM, they're making this cutting edge avant-garde music, but it's very much just like pointed at like the community and the common person people with no musical training and a lot of sort of the impetus behind the group is pitch at those people, which I think is so interesting um, because uh, in a lot of the ways that legacy seems to be gone. Um, I mean, I don't know why. I mean, I could like harbor some guesses, but I don't think now's the time, but it's just sort of an interesting tension to think about. I think regarding like avant-garde aesthetics and you know, the people. Yeah. Also, to an interesting point that you just made, it's like these are highly professional people playing at a very high level with the mind of playing for the, we'll say, the basis of the socioeconomic ladder. Mm-hmm. Very much like Shakespeare in a way. It's like right, Shakespeare right, right. wrote for the very common man mm-hmm. and for the, for you know, it, it, and it was music. The verse was music going, uh, and obviously prose too, of course. We're not going to get into the whole thing. Mm-hmm. But um, but it's, you're, you're writing for people, for everyone, for a common Right, no, totally, totally. No. Um, yeah. Very cool. Um, well, as like I said, it's for everyone. So I just wanted to, you know, start off with this saying this music's for everyone, <laughs> and uh, so don't don't turn it off yet, okay, folks. Yeah. We got another piece later to bring to you. Um, and as I mentioned earlier too, is that your music is very informed by. Um, if you you can hear in those different combinations, the popular jazz, uh, a bit of classical influence, and contemporary uh, improvisationals, um, uh, and so you know. W- you mentioned an influence earlier, so of this particular song, like, what are who do you cite as kind of your influences um, in, in in your compositions? Uh, I mean, I'm writing a dissertation about influence, so I can't like really speak about <laughs> influence, influence like offhanded. <laughs> yeah, about influence. I mean, I think with that music when I was writing it, I mean, the way I'm working, that's definitely not anything new. It's coming out of like the AACM. It's coming out of like you know Ornette, Ornette Coleman. It's coming out from. Chicago people, it's coming out of, you know, uh, people like Tim Byrne or Henry Threadgill um, or sort of, you know, like these titans in, of improvised music. Um, but I really hope it doesn't sound like them. And I hope, uh, I mean, it's a tough thing because I really, really don't want to copy anyone. And I don't think I'm copying anyone. Um, but I think that music, it's really, in a certain sense, it's about musical techniques. And it's about, I think when I was writing that music, it was sort of, you know, summer 2020, deep pandemic sort of situation. And I was just like really trying to work out some just like technical things regarding like writing music, regarding putting written music together with improvised music. Um, And so I think really that's what my music is influenced by is solving certain technical problems, which of course talk thinking about music in terms of solving technical problems carries its own sort of historical baggage. So I'm very much influenced by, you know, the Austro German tradition, um, like Bach, Beethoven, uh, Brahms, Mahler, Schoenberg, Webern, Berg, those people, yeah. um, in terms of, I don't know. It's just like very important to me that my, the music I write and the music I improvise is like rigorous in a certain way, which again, that's an aesthetic and that's, I think yeah. a way that that influence is, is present. Yeah. Um, and like I was saying, when, when, we're, when we improvise, there's something where it's like, yes, you need to like accept whatever happens and you need to just have faith that whatever you put forth into the ensemble will be cool. But at the same time with the written material, it's like, it's not cool if you don't like nail that and if it doesn't feel good and if it doesn't feel funky. And so there, there is this tension in my music that I think is interesting between 
like on the one hand like it's really not cool if you don't like nail it but on the other hand like you need to accept whatever happens and you can't judge it when so do you I, let go is a question right when do you let go uh, when, 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 yeah yeah because like <laughs> nailing it is so subjective mm -hmm. but you have to be please yourself first mm -hmm. i hope oh totally um but i also think there's something at least with like the written moments in the music which oh. i hope you can sort of hear um when you listen to it mm -hmm. There is something like there is something objective. There are notes on the page and there are sort of just like technicals and principles of counterpoint. And there are sort of like restrictions I've placed on myself and sort of a standard I hold myself to just technically that it's like to me, if like that stuff isn't happening, it's not cool. Do you approach it like a math problem in a way? Are you very musical minded, math musical minded when you write? Oh, there's definitely, it's about like geometry and proportion yeah. Yeah. and sort of balance and like these sorts of things. But at the same time, I think that the, the things that I write that I'm happiest with are the ones that sort of achieve a peak level of formal rigor while also sort of having this sort of almost like feral expressive abandon to them or something like that. So again, I think that tension is very interesting. Um, and I also find when I write the, there's often a time where if I'm working within these sort of like networks of parameters um, and making decisions based on that while also trying to, you know, imagine in my ear what things are sounding like. And I mean, that's a whole other question of just like, what is it to like imagine a melody you've never heard before? Um, I don't know. But anyways, as I'm working through these very sort of dense lattices of parameters, there's usually a point where I hear something that I think sounds so good, but it requires me to suspend my rules and i think those are the moments that i sort of write music for are those moments where it's like no i have this sound is so beautiful i love I that need to abandon your, yeah and then i can come back to it that's really great i love that you, you, you took the word out of my mouth you're abandoning i didn't mean to finish your phrase either mm -hmm. but it's like you 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 have it's it's that good you're willing to break your rules to find you know new ground right uh, right right and, and have you always kind of written that way is it something that you've always like when you start started out writing like was it kind of like AACM style, like like going towards like using them as perhaps, like I said, for lack of a better term, the influence uh, and others that you said and the Germans, uh, the composers. I was like, it's like, was that always been kind of like the style you start out writing for, or do you start as appreciating that and that informed your writing style? Or were you writing other things and then being exposed to them that kind of mm -hmm. shaped your writing? I think it's 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 more the latter. I mean, I've written like a lot of music in a lot of different ways, um, and just over the years built up just like a you know, skill set. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I think it takes time to really figure out what you care about aesthetically um, and, you know, what your actual uh, commitments are. So yeah, no, it took me some time to sort of really zero in on those concerns as I laid them out. And that became your voice, so to speak. You said you, you're finding, or do you think <laughs> yeah, you're still finding yeah. your voice? Uh, I mean, I'm sort of suspect of the notion of voice, but at the same time, I think my music does have a sound. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think my approach, well, not like unprecedented or anything like that. Um, I think I have sort of like my own sort of way between sort of these, you know, pillars of musical, of the musical past. Um, so if that's a voice, I guess, but it's also... I don't know. I have so much to learn and, uh, you know, I figure I'll be entering my creative prime, I hope in like 20 years. So I'm sort of like w just working towards that and trying to get better until that and just like put myself in a position where I can actually continue, uh, you know, spending a lot of time yeah. thinking about these things. Well, you know, you should be, I mean, I think it's great you have that, that kind of attitude because it's about lifetime learning for me too. It's mm -hmm. like these interviews like I learned so much from other people and also I think that I think that I've always said these these podcasts are also educational for other people who are listening and mm -hmm. they're, they're picking up different ways of like uh, process is something you can't learn until you do it right yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so and so by hearing about other processes and hearing mm -hmm. about you know I ask these questions about voice and I ask questions about um, you know, approach and, you know, some standard influence questions here, there and too sometimes, but you know, it's about finding what works for you and, and right. saying like, you don't have to have like this big ego about saying like, Oh, that's Charlie. Kurt. I know that right away mm -hmm. when you hear like the first five mm -hmm. seconds, but it's important though. I think the takeaway is that you recognize that you have a style mm -hmm. and that, and your, and your, and your style is still evolving, which is great mm -hmm. because Lord knows who you're going to meet and what you're going to listen to. 
that right. moves you forward mm-hmm. or who mm-hmm. you play with. Right, right, right. Yeah. Totally. Um, well, and speaking of, as a composer, I imagine you have a certain idea of not only someone who can play the score, um, but how the music is to be played. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, what kind of skill set and versatility do you look for in the musical vocabulary performer when putting together these live? Uh, I mean, I really look for people who have very broad skill sets. Um, I'm drawn to musicians who you know, are really comfortable playing sort of traditional jazz styles, are really comfortable, uh, you know, reading complex scores, and then are also comfortable, you know, improvising with sound and noise. Um, so, I mean, luckily there's a lot of people in New York City who can handle that sort of thing. Um, but I don't know, I think for me that's really like the, um, yeah, in collaborators, what, what, I, what I look for. Um, because I think it's an interesting question, given the yeah. fact that you you have you brought up the word rigor many times. Mm-hmm. It's like which which means like there's such care and being placed into the score, mm-hmm. but giving it over to a live performer, like you have to have a trust in their departures with it. Oh, totally, totally. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it's also like you need people for whom like it's just not going to be a huge deal to play the parts because you don't want to be for just like basic old like economic reasons, you don't want somebody to have to pour in like hours and hours and hours sure. learning your music. Yeah. Um, so just practically speaking, if people can sit down and like read it pretty well the first time, um, it just makes everything more feasible to pull off. Uh, so interesting question, I think. Let's go back to exploring the practice of where theory and reality meet. Um, what are we gonna hear next? Oh, this is, uh, this is sort of something different. This is from a piano trio I'm a part of called Rooms. Um, these are all people I knew in Chicago, and now we're in New York City, and one of us is in Copenhagen. But this is an album that's about to come out on September 30th. Um, it's going to be called Sit Down, and you could find it on Bandcamp if you just search Rooms Trio, probably bandcamp.com slash Rooms Trio. Um, and yeah, this is just something different. I mean, I wrote this song like a long time ago. Um, and this record was recorded like four years ago and we're just putting it out now for some reason. Um, so it, it has like this strange quality to me of being familiar, but also feeling like something I never had anything to do with. Um, and I think it just maybe shows a different sort of side of my, uh, my aesthetic. Um, yeah, and that's all I have to say about that one right now. All right. Like I said, when words fail, let's listen to some music (laughs) here. Once again, Charlie Kirchin.
that had a, like a trancy hypnotic quality to the uh, mm -hmm. to it. Um, I don't know why, but I, mm -hmm. that was the like the 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 center of that piece for me. Mm, it had a cool. very interesting kind of. Uh, you know, I was listening to it this morning as well, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it just. Um, um, I, should, I should say, I don't want to. I'll rephrase. I'll use the word meditative. Mm -hmm. It was a very meditative piece for me. Okay, cool. Yeah, really enjoyed it. Um, yeah, that one, and I love Dan Pearson, who's playing keyboards and doing the production. The keyboard sounds he found for that too, I think, really enhanced that. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a meditative feeling. Yeah. Um, and then of course it's just amazing what repetition will do. Yeah. Um, the uh, sort of clave that just repeats. And then also, I think we, what do we play the form three times? I, there's no improvising. Um, but yeah, it's just amazing what repetition will do. Yeah, and it's a short piece. Yeah. It's short. And, um, yeah, I, I, I actually, yeah, I like that one too. I think it came off well. Yeah, absolutely. Very cool. Um, so I want to talk about something that, uh, people in our community can possibly witness. Um, as we're working on it. Uh -huh. um, so, and we'll, hopefully we'll also come off well uh, to give <laughs> Uptown audiences something to look forward to. Uh, and what Artworks is going to uh, look to present a world premiere of a 50 minute composition uh, from you, uh, accompanied by a short lecture mm -hmm. here in Inwood. Uh, in a year from now, a year uh, from hopefully, now, yeah. uh, if all things yeah, fall, a year uh, I mean, a lot can happen yeah. in a year in the world, as we well know. <laughs> but you know what? We got to make plans. We got to look. True, we have to have yeah. something to look forward to, <laughs> yeah. Charlie. Right? Um, so um, uh, I'll just talk a tiny bit. The idea about behind the concert is designed to introduce new audiences to the world of jazz experimental music, uh, and, and it'll feature a sextet um, of. New York City instrumentalists, though. Mm -hmm. We're not bringing anybody from Chicago. We can't afford the budget. Uh, we're going to try to keep it local here. Um, so New York City instrumentalists, performers, and improv improvisers, uh, like most of our programming here uptown in the northern Manhattan area, we're doing this because there literally is no scene up here, mm -hmm. period, for anything but particularly when there's not anything subgenres really get the short shrift so there isn't um there isn't a place like you know name it the village vanguard slash you know smalls mm -hmm. or any kind of the birdlands of uh or any kind of the small places where you'd go check out in the village or brooklyn um a nice jazz night somewhere you'd have to go to a restaurant of some kind and you know hopefully hear it over the clanking of plates and martini glasses. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not going to be that kind of thing. This is going to be a, a focus on um, on this. And, um, you know, because uh, this, you know, it, our audiences deserve it, and so yeah. do you, right? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So, um, yeah, thanks for your support with all this. And do you want me to talk about that? Yeah, yeah, talk about it. So, yeah, we applied for a grant from uh, Lower Manhattan Cultural Council. Yeah. Um, and we're hoping it comes through. You never know with these things. We never know. We um, gotta try. But uh, yeah, basically the idea is that I'm putting together a new band right now, and we'll be playing around Brooklyn later in the fall and in the winter. Um, and uh, yeah, basically I'm just trying to get a budget to really get some music together, write some new material, and then um, just put on a crazy concert here at the Church of the Good Shepherd next yeah. September. Free for all, by the way. And that's the idea, is mm -hmm. that we're trying to create access to this music. Exactly, exactly. Um, so, yeah, it'll be sort of like what you've been um, hearing on the show today, except better, because hopefully we're always getting better. Um, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm cautiously optimistic. Yeah. And it'll be great. Do you have any kind of, um, not to get the cat out of the bag, so to speak, but um, again, we're only talking about it, not hearing it. Uh, any kind of direction of exploration or sketch for the piece? Uh, I haven't really thought that far ahead. I'm always writing music. Yeah. So I feel like for this piece, I won't really start thinking about it probably until next summer, like next June. I love that. Um, but uh, luckily there's ideas everywhere. Yeah. and. I'm not too stressed about Perhaps it. Perhaps an idea yeah. inspired by Uptown, maybe. Yeah, totally, in totally. The, in the neighborhood, yeah. you never know. <laughs> um, but I think it's important, and, and it's 
reason why I wanted to bring it up and have you talk about it too is that you know producing free concerts aren't free to produce, <laughs> and uh, we pay all our artists who work for mm-hmm. us, and um, it's important mm-hmm. that you know uh, artists are entrepreneurs, they are merchants, uh, they deserve to be paid. Uh, so if you, uh, by any chance, dear listener, would like to sponsor this concert or help us out uh, putting money towards helping out to bring more free community concerts to our neighborhood or, or at very little cost, uh, we could definitely use your support because it's something that we're trying to keep going here. We've done a few of them over the past three years, um, and Good Shepherd's been a wonderful partner. And, and we're willing to go other places too, of course, but um, you know, it's it's really great to have, um, as as we you all know from being listeners in this podcast, we have such a embarrassment of artists here in our neighborhood and it's a venue desert here as far as being able to find places for them to perform or exhibit their work uh so any any help you can give we greatly appreciate it and you can reach out via uh at info at in what for more information um charlie it's been a pleasure speaking with you uh and before we say goodbye where can we send people to find out more about your current and forthcoming projects Oh, man, I wish I had a better answer. I needed to get a website. Um, we have your Bandcamp, right? I have a Bandcamp. So, yeah, uh, Bandcamp.com slash Charlie Kirchin should do it. And I also have an Instagram, which I don't check. Um, so, But you can follow been... me there. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. Yeah. What, what, what is it? Charlie Kirchin. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Cool. Um, so yeah. we'll, include, we'll include those uh, links in the description of this episode. So people can follow your music or... Or, or just follow you, even though they don't expect anything from you. Expect things from me, just not in the social media realm. Oh, do tell then. How, okay. how should we expect from you? Oh yeah, well, there's this number of records coming out in the coming months. You know, I'll just give you the the, the yeah. links to those. Great. Um, yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Very good. Thank you again, Charlie, for being here. Yeah. Thank you for um, having me. This was a blast. You bet. You bet. Um, so this is the Artist Spotlight episode of In What Artworks On Air, where we meet the musicians, filmmakers, writers, theater makers, and artists of all stripes who make their home here in Upper Manhattan. If you have a moment, please show us some love right now and rate and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts. It really does help us. Many thanks to Church of Good Shepherd here in Inwood NYC for hosting us and to HideSites.com for promotional support. You can support On Air and all of our programming making a tax-free donation at inwoodartworks.nyc backslash donate and at Venmo. Be sure to follow us on social media at Inwood Artworks to keep up with all that we do, including the Inwood Film Festival, Filmworks Al Fresco, public art galleries, live performances, and so much more. Inwood Artworks On Air is proud to be supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with City Council. From the top of Manhattan and the bottom of our hearts, thank you so much for tuning in. This is Aaron Sims for Inwood Artworks On Air.